we wanted you to have just a moment of frustration, just a small moment of not getting absolutely what you want when you want it, um, so that you can begin to empathize in a very small way with the images that you're about to s that you saw when you went into the gallery space, um, and get a tiny little taste of what goes on in the daily life uh, of Palestinians. Um, and you saw on the other side of the checkpoint that there is a beautiful image called Hope. And Katie will explain about how that image came to be as well. And that's the uh, message that we want you to leave the gallery with. But we don't want you to leave the gallery yet. We want you to hear Katie's speech and um, go back and look at the work. Um, just to let you know, all the work is for sale. And we also have the uh, five uh, images in poster form um, as well. So if anyone is interested in taking any of those home, um, please see me and uh, we'll facilitate that. Without further ado, Katie Archibald Woodward. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Well, first of all, it is an amazing uh, joy and honor to be here with all of you this evening. Thank you so much. And Dagmar, thank you so much. So uh, to tell you a little backstory, uh, about two years ago, I was in a, a season of discerning where to focus my energies. And I spoke with a few mentors and advisors. And two of those conversations were pivotal. One was with a dear friend and mentor of mine, Billy, and who, after learning about my sort of magnetic pull <laughs> to the Middle East, encouraged that I go back. Uh, my draw to the region began as a child, uh, captivated and intrigued by the real stories and places of the ancient biblical uh, stories that I had grown up with. And then my second year of seminary in 2010, I studied abroad, and one of the other students happened to be a Palestinian Lutheran um, about to be ordained. And he was my first introduction to the occupation. Then in 2011, I found myself, in fact, going to the Holy Land, and Billy suggested that I consider using my growing interest in visual storytelling and justice work to highlight the pressing issues in Palestine and Israel. So I talked to that away. And then I, I saw a consultant who meets with young fem female entrepreneurs in the Atlanta area, which is where I live, named Shanna. And after hearing my story and kind of my saga of like, where am I going to go? What am I going to do with my life? Um, she reflected back to me, you know, I keep hearing you talk about your interest in documentary photography. Why don't you just let yourself try it for a year? And it was like this green light turned on somewhere in my depths. And I realized that that was exactly what my heart was very eager and ready to do. So I considered, okay, if I'm going to pursue this just for a year to start, I need to do my dream project, whatever that is. And I thought, okay, that would be the best way of knowing if I want to continue in this documentary work or not. And so emerged from its tucked away place that thought of Palestine and Israel. There, I realized, held for me the crucial stories and the issues that needed to be documented and shared. So at this realization, I felt this sort of spark in me. Something was resonating, pieces were coming together, and there was this sense of a yes. And so then a title also came through the checkpoint uh, to be this framework to reference the literal experience that you tasted as you walked in of having to cross through checkpoints on a daily basis. This key element of the occupation, of asserting control and power over Palestinians and their allies. And also to refer to points that one can check off in their mind as identifiers of occupation, such as land confiscation, lack of water rights, access to power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I began this journey that I knew would significantly change my life. But I didn't know in what ways, and I didn't know how profoundly. And I was a bit scared, and I considered just how these changes might shape me and how what I might see and hear affect my life. 
But I knew that I had been led to this decision by a desire and excitement and love and this sense of freedom and a whole slew of other signs. Before this project, signs were a very regular part of my life. They are often how I get direction and a sense of affirmation that I'm on my path. But I never in my life have seen so many signs, like extraordinary signs, <laughs> and consistently uh, than since I said yes to Through the Checkpoint, this, this season when I've really needed them most. And the first huge sign arrived when I came to Washington, D.C. last summer for an orientation before heading to Palestine, Israel for three weeks on a delegation with an organization called Interfaith Peace Builders. Because it had been three years since my previous trip to the region when I'd gone in 2013 with my parents who are here, I wanted to reacquaint myself with the area before returning in the fall for seven weeks to do a majority of the documentation. So I flew in a few hours before my orientation began and headed over to a coffee shop, luggage and all, and did some work out on the patio. And after a little while, a man sitting next to me leaned over and asked, Oh, I see you have luggage. Where are you traveling? And I said, well, actually, I'm about to go to Palestine, Israel. He said, well, I'm Palestinian. <laughs> I was like, you can imagine my amazement. That just doesn't happen very often. And I it was like, really? And he said, yes, and I'm an artist, and I have a curator and a gallery that I'd like to connect you with. I think they would be interested in your work. So his name was Sean Raba. You might have seen some of his work here before. Um, and the curator, as you can guess, was Dagmar and the gallery Al Quds. So <laughs> it was that then a year ago, before I had even begun the majority of my documentation, there was a gallery ready and waiting to host through the checkpoint. It's like that was a sign. <laughs> you know? So that particular Interfaith Peace Builders delegation I participated on steeped us in the history and contemporary realities of the 50-year occupation while placing a special emphasis on child incarceration. And I'm not sure if it was while I was on the ground that summer or while I was doing research in between the delegation and returning in the fall that it at last I, I gained clarity as to why it was so hard for me to absorb the truth of the history of the conflict and the genuine crisis at hand. I realized it's because it is so outrageous. It, is it, it was just extremely difficult for my brain to comprehend and really believe all that is going on. It's hard to believe that Palestinian children are really taken in the middle of the night from their homes by Israeli military held in soli solitary confinement, psychologically abused, and often physically abused as well. It's hard to believe that millions of people have no citizenship because their homeland has not been able to es establish itself as a state. But until then, Palestinians must get perm and and until then, excuse me, Palestinians must get permission from the Israeli government to commute almost anywhere. It's mind-boggling to think that Palestinians, like the families I lived with in Bethlehem and Hebron, cannot freely travel to Jerusalem, which is only eight miles away from Bethlehem. And they can't visit family in Jerusalem or in Israel or go to the Al-Aqsa Mosque for Eid or the Holy Sepulchre Church for Easter without permits from the Israeli government. And if permits are granted, sometimes not enough are given for the whole family to go. And so then they have to make this awful decision of, okay, who's going to stay behind? And then you're separated on one of the most sacred holidays of the year. So these and countless more are part and parcel of living under military occupation. These realities were so baffling to me that they were once very difficult to comprehend. But with time and reflection, these facts have begun to sink in for me as the true and grievous realities that they are for our Palestinian neighbors and loved ones. But most profoundly, it was personal experience that really caused me to awaken to the realities of life under occupation. Crossing checkpoints really do something to a person. On a basic level, they're tedious. I mean, your, your route is never guaranteed. A checkpoint may be closed off for that day, or a checkpoint may specifically be closed off to you for a reason you may or may not ever know. 
And then more than that, um, they're a degrading experience and frightening sometimes. Degrading that you're continuously under suspicion and uh, fearful of doing something that would make a soldier want to question your behavior. It can be disconcerting at times or frightening and that you have an 18-year-old soldier wielding an assault rifle to check your ID, maybe pat you down, maybe require that you wait for an indefinite, indefinite amount of time in a room at the checkpoint to maybe eventually be questioned. When I arrived for my second round of documentation last September, it was late at night, I was out of it, and completely focused on getting through customs at Ben Gurion Airport successfully and catching the last bus to Jerusalem. Not until the next morning did I realize that somewhere along the way I'd lost my little white uh, visa slip. And they don't stamp your passports anymore in Israel due to the fact that some of the neighboring countries don't let you in with an Israeli stamp and vice versa. So they've gone to paper. However, this little paper cannot be replaced, or at least they would not replace it for me. And so I, I was like, okay, what am I going to do about this? <laughs> and so when I inquired about getting a new one, I was informed that, oh, well, the computers at the checkpoints um, will be able to uh, access the information on your passport and notify the soldier that you have a three-month pass or visa. So um, I thought, okay, fine. So one day, I arrive at checkpoint 300, going from Jerusalem into Bethlehem. And the soldier informed me that his computer was not set up to collect such information from my passport. So I explained that this is what I'd been told and that it worked just fine at Columbia checkpoint. And he told me, well, then you should go to Columbia, which is like 30 minutes away, at least, from the checkpoint that I was at. So... Thankfully, uh, for some reason, unbeknownst to me, he decided to let me in. And I was fortunate. I was fortunate that I got that soldier. Fortunate that perhaps my American citizenship helped me. Fortunate I was not forced to go to Colombia. Fortunate that nothing worse happened. But I didn't want to risk any more checkpoints after that. So I had to hire drivers. Um, I had to rearrange my schedule so that I could avoid checkpoints as much as possible. It was a minor situation compared to what most people go through, um, but it was bad enough for me. And because of that, I really experienced what it was like to feel confined. Um, I felt nervous about some checkpoints. I got a taste of what it's like to have limited access to movement. And I, and I experienced really what it was like to be controlled. Um, my desires, my plans, my safety, controlled by the powers of the occupation. And so, but all the while, um, living in the crux of this reality, Palestinians radiate this resilience. Uh, they, they have this. Um, the steadfastness, it's smud in Arabic. And they are determined to keep their dignity, to fight for their equity, to be treated as human beings, to dream, to be educated, and to remain on the land. It is this complex web of realities I aim to present and through the checkpoint, to expose the atrocities of the occupation and its dehumanization of people. The unacceptable continuation of the international laws being broken by the Israeli government I also hope to illuminate, such as the Jewish settlers who continue to inhabit the West Bank illegally. To illuminate the increasing decline of the Palestinian Christians, a meager 1-3% to of the population left in the land where their faith was birthed. And to address that there are a dwindling number of opportunities for the many highly educated Palestinians to find work in their field and thus are forced to immigrate. I am also determined to highlight that not all is lost. Far from it. There are a number of stellar organizations and individuals who are working to address these issues and to pursue a coexistence without occupation. 
groups like We Am in Bethlehem are teaching youth about reconciliation methods and giving tours to international groups to help them understand and learn about the living stones. That is, the contemporary people and the realities in the region. Not only the ancient holy sites and the monuments and the ruins. There are organizations like the Parent Circle Families Forum that bring bereaved family members together who have lost loved ones to the occupation to share their stories with each other, to commit to building relationships across cultural lines, working for reconciliation, and to pursue healing from the ground up. What I gathered from them is that bridges need to be built. Reconciliation needs to be fostered. And healing needs to be pursued both from the ground up as well as the government down. What I also learned in listening to all of these stories from Palestinian Muslims, Christians, Bedouin, and Jewish Israelis is that, yes, there is a major problem. It's called the occupation. And also, there is much we can do about it. And that is what I hope to convey to all of you tonight. There is much to be done, and there is much that we can do. As you listen to or read the stories in the exhibition, I hope that you will hear some opportunities and ideas of how you too can get involved in the work for ending the occupation. And of course, being involved in the many opportunities that are presented here in the Jerusalem Fund or other ways. And that there are also uh, more that perhaps you are involved with that you know about and can share with some of us, um, as well as uh, a whole slew of opportunities on a resource sheet right by the earphones out there in the foyer um, at the reception desk. So I invite you to take one of those resource sheets before you leave. You can find reading materials, both um, online information, uh, magazines, books, articles, organizations to partner with, a whole, a whole gamut of options. Oh, also ways to travel there, which is what I highly recommend. Um, the people need you to come, and that is really the way that you are going to be able to fully understand what is going on and how, how we as global neighbors and citizens are invited and called to help um, with the ending of the occupation so that all of our neighbors can live in freedom and peace. So I share all of these opportunities with you tonight also so that you can be part of, um, of something that one Palestinian man told me, which I thought was just so uh, profound. He said, as long as people continue to care, we have reason to hope. So now I will leave you with these words of hope and encouragement and then um, open up a time for question and answer. May we be drawn into harmony with all, created and divine, moment by moment and choice by choice, that we might know the richness of life, discovered when we are exposed to the diversity of the world, that we might know the joy of life, found when we increase in awareness and can begin to notice the little and big gifts ever coming to us and dwelling in our midst. That we might know the love of life, revealed when we vulnerably endeavor to notice that which veils our eyes, our ears, and hearts, and take the step to let love transform it, and then do it again. Thank you.